Thank you very much for this introduction. I don't have any slides. Um, I want to thank you, Ulf, for inviting me back here. I was in Sweden not too long ago. Um, it's become a tradition to have at least two trips per year back to Sweden and mostly to SLU. Um, this is an indication of the nature of the relationship, the strength of the partnership and the collaboration that we have with your institution. I was really thrilled to hear some of the remarks on how SLU played a critical role in setting up a global network for research and for development, the CGR consult cons consultative group on international agricultural research. So I stand before you today representing a little bit of the institution where I work for, the, institution, the International Livestock Research Institute, and also my own program. And I want to say that the CGR has a lot of impact, including capacity building, and I'm one of the recipients of the capacity building from that system. So it goes a long way to show you how we have to continue to count on this type of organization if we were to move significantly in achieving the vision for 2030. Uh, my remarks today will have, in the first instance, a little bit of general comments. I'll also contextualize the SDGs uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. What does it mean? Because um, we have a common agenda, thank God for that. But we also have to be sensitive that we are not starting from the same standpoint. Other regions are a little bit ahead of others. So I will do that contextualization just to see, not just to discourage us, but to, to, for us to appreciate the type of work that we have to put in place, the effort that we have to put in place to dream that we can get to the finish line. So they are very important and very positive signs that I would like to share with you. And the third part, uh, you asked me to talk about research, um, the context or the, the, the African perspective. You know, that's really broad, but I, I took liberty to, to simplify that and bring it back to agriculture. Because I think from what we've heard, for Africa to actually provide sustainable livelihood, income generation, agriculture must always be part of the equation. So, um, Swedish investment in setting up the CGR is extremely well appreciated. And the CGR has evolved to be established as one of the strongest research networks that you can find across the world. And the CGR has really established very strong partnerships with national organizations, regional organizations, and also other global players. And from the FAO slides here, we could see that the CGR features there. They came into play tackling global issues in crop uh, improvement, livestock, and many other, and many other challenges. So um, the CGR, I will come to talk a little bit about its impact later on in my presentation. But I really want to emphasize that the CGRs have been around for 40 years. In December, I also had the pleasure to participate uh, and offer remarks at the Science Day for CEDA. And it was really impressive to share some of the impacts coming from the CGR work. So the SDGs, um, I don't want to repeat what has been said uh, previously. They're, we, they're here for us. You know, the, the, the SDGs means uh, to, to Sweden what they would mean to Senegal and stuff like that. And I think uh, that's really bringing the element of partnership and the common vision and the collaboration into play. They have existed before. The pre one of the previous speakers say it's no longer us and them, it's us. We are part of this. It is an, imp an inspiring vision for the, how the world will look like in 2030. We can sit here in Sweden, you can complain and stuff. You said you're Swedish, you, you can complain. Some people in the world actually do not even have a stage where they can complain. And we have to see our mandate, we have to see our energy, the resolve that we, 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 we put in place to drive this as representing those who are voiceless. I come from a rural part of Cameroon 
where being educated could just be a mere accident because uh, there, everything, there is everything against you. And we have to keep that in mind that pushing for us to achieve these SDGs is really driving women, children, and many other people out of poverty to actually have something to eat per day and also to have a school to go to and to cross a bridge to go and sell their produces and stuff like that. So I'm very happy that these are now our issues. We are, we are in this together. One of the previous remarks was you can list your neighbors, Denmark, Norway, and stuff, but your neighbors can also be Cameroon. Your neighbor can be South Africa, can be Vietnam, because the world is now interconnected. It goes a long way to demonstrate the importance of having this SDGs in which we are really all together. A recent assessment by the UK-based uh, Office for Develop, uh, um, uh, Development uh, Initiative indicated that based on current effort focusing on these global issues, the following achievement can be expected for 2030. I just want to list one of them. Poverty could be virtually eradicated, but is that continuously across the world? It could be in some places. For those who do mathematics, you can come up with an average but you're not sensitive to places where poverty is still there. They also say that by that time, we will have only 150 mater mater mortali maternal mortality from 100,000 live uh, births. But if you look at the, the, the window, it goes from 16 in a country like this to more than 500 in sub-Saharan Africa. How do we try to drive the bottom up to, to, to the middle and even above? It also says that in 2030, more children in sub-Saharan Africa will be completing secondary education. How many are those? We don't know. Is it continuous? Is it the same thing that we see in Kenya, that we'll be seeing in South Africa, Senegal, or Central African Republic? So we have to be really sensitive and analyze this further. It also says that more than 20% of public revenue will be shared as GDP increase in sub-Saharan Africa. When we talk about GDP, we have to be very careful. Where is that GDP coming from? Is it related to agriculture? Is it part of extractive industries? And if it is coming from extractive industries, instead of closing the gap between the poor and the, the rich, that gap is actually widened. So it goes again to impress on the point that for sub-Saharan Africa, agricultural development is extremely important and has to be part of the equation as we tackle the SDGs. Again, detailed analysis of the SDGs demonstrate that if you take the 17 SDGs and put them on some kind of through, through a lens, only three of them are on course to be achieved in 2030. Ending poverty is possible. The, 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 the light is green. In, increasing economic growth is also in the least developed country is also possible. Alting deforestation is also possible. In fact, the data shows that by 2020, um, the, 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 the acreage or the surface of the land covered by, uh, by the forest will be increasing. But when you look at other SDGs, we are really, if we are not careful, we are not on course. And one of them is really um, zero hunger. If we have to achieve that goal, much has to be done at the moment. But I'm, I'm not going to talk about the ones that really require a very drastic and a transformative agenda, one of them being tr uh, climate change and marine uh, ecosystems. This is every day or every second something is happening when it comes to climate change and the marine ecosystem. For that one, we need a very, very strong and transformational agenda to, to be on course. So it goes a long way again to say that um, when we are talking about the SDGs, we have to analyze from every region. We have to act locally and think globally. But acting locally is very, very important. Otherwise, we can do the average and everybody will be fine. So the SDGs, I was asked uh, to talk about research uh, in Africa for food security and bring our perspective. As I mentioned, I want to bring this to focus more on agricultural research. Why do I do this? I do this because much of the African population is still rural. 
more than 70% of the African population still benefit either directly or indirectly from agricultural uh, practices. So if we are to achieve uh, these SDGs, looking at income generation, sustainable management of natural resources and stuff like that, we have to focus on what the largest segment of the population is looking at. And I want to repeat something that I mentioned earlier. If your GDP is increased from extractive industry, the likelihood of widening the gap between the poor and the rich is high. But if your SDG is increased from agricultural development, you're most likely going to double or even triple the impact on your population. And when we look at rural areas in Africa, we are looking at women and children laboring. Men often do not have the incentive to be working full time. I don't know why it is like that, but that's just what you observe throughout rural Africa. So if we are to focus on that targeting children and women positively is also something that we can achieve. And I also want to bring onto the equation of African agriculture the role or the challenges with smallholder farmers. When we're looking at a 70 or 80 percent of that population practicing directly or indirectly agriculture, smallholder farming is part of the equation. You don't have big farms, but you have smaller farms distributed in families. And in fact, the size of the farm is shrinking. So how can we bring the smallholder farmers to be part of the solution, and we shouldn't always see them as the problem? Some have said, why don't we just push smallholder farmers, give my whole village to one developer, and then he will grow wheat or banana and plantain, and everybody will be happy. It will not be possible, because we are displacing people who do not have other skills to go into other jobs. So smallholder farming must be part of the equation. And we actually look at smallholder farmers down because these are essentially failed businesses. Why are they failed businesses? Because they don't have access to the right seat. I, I was very happy to see here that in Zimbabwe, was it Zimbabwe, a farmer can call and say, do I harvest now or I can wait for next week? It can be for a, a whole range of reasons. Is the market ready for me? Is my crop ready? Is it going to rot? Do I have the road to take it to the market and stuff like that? This is what we have to do. We've been interacting very significantly with smallholder farmers. Only their businesses have failed. They have a lot of knowledge. If we could empower them, if we could bring our research to contextualize it, to put it at the central of what are the issues for smallholder farmers, I think they will be part of the solution because they are not going to go away. They will always be there. So the numbers are clear when it comes to African agriculture. Productivity, the gap is very wide. In a place where you can harvest 10 tons of wheat in Europe and stuff like that, in Africa, if you're lucky, you can get one tenth, sometimes even one twentieth. Why is it so? Because the value chains are not clearly uh, uh, defined. The farmers is not empowered with the right seat. The support, the extension service, they are not always there. So when we talk about research, the biosciences research that I'm very excited about has to be only part of the equation. It has to be linking to other type of sciences. It has to have the right support system. And I'm very thrilled here today to be talking about, to be, to be talking in the same context with eminent ambassadors. My message to you is that when we are negotiating these sustainable development goals, you have to push our governments to be very serious about their commitments. Scientists are discouraged. They are doing well. They are, pro they are releasing, they are developing new varieties and stuff like that. But simple things like a small company to deal with the seed system is not there. And the farmers for years and years will continue to, to go on and plant the wrong seed. So research will continue. The research is strong. It will be stronger. But it has to be in the context of where other support systems are. So that's my message for you, for your negotiation. Farming uh, uh, in Africa could be really, I mean, addressing the challenges of agriculture in Africa can be, you know, can be articulated in a number of ways. But currently, my own program, Biosciences Eastern and Central Africa, 
interacting very strongly with AU NEPAD. It's actually a co-creation of AU NEPAD and the International Livestock Research Institute, highlighting once again the importance of the CGR system in driving agricultural productivity in Africa. So my program and many of the local, regional, and continental agendas are focusing on five different research themes. One is livestock, because when we look at the global trends, the demand for livestock products has surpasses the wheat and the rice and stuff like that. So livestock development is extremely important. Even when you look at Africa, although some of the animal keepers are not keeping them in, in hundreds and thousands, but they keep two or three cows as an as asset building. So we have to work in making sure that those assets are protected and that those animals are also producing what people need from them, milk. Here you can buy your milk, you can stock it for a week and a month and put it in a, in a refrigerator, but in rural Africa it's not possible. If you have your animal that could be providing you milk on a daily basis, that's really fighting to have the micronutrients that children would, would need. So we are not developing vaccines for people who keep big herds of animals. Once again, we have to contextualize it. How can we support smallholder farmers, people who keep only two or three animals, to have access to those products? So the second area is really looking at crops. You have your big items, the maize, the wheat, the rice, the cassava. I was very thrilled to see the cassava work here in Vietnam. It's also everywhere in Africa, specifically in Nigeria, where it has really taken a completely different dimension in terms of transformation for human nutrition, for bakery and animal feed and stuff like that. So things are really happening. So the third thing that we're looking at is food safety. It's one thing to increase your productivity. It's one thing to say, I have enough food for my people. But it's really another thing to serve that food safe for human consumption. We are talking about, you talk about uh, losses. In Africa, most of the losses, unfortunately, at the harvest re uh, level. And I would say that if we could only transform or utilize 100% of what is produced, that, should, that could be part of the solution right away without even increasing productivity. So post food safety, post-harvest management and stuff like that should really be looked into. Because people are producing, when you travel across rural Africa, you see people producing a lot of food, but there is no way they can channel all that through a market. I come from western part of Cameroon. When I drive from Yaoundé to the western part of Cameroon, during some seasons, you roll down the windows of your car, you smell alcohol. Because people will take their bananas, their mangoes to the roadside to sell during the day. But they sell only one-fifth of what they brought. They have travel putting those buckets on their head. They travel about 10 kilometers. At the end of the day, they turn by the roadside, they throw them there, and then they go back to the village. Who on this world can have sustainable production system if you're only utilizing only one-tenth of what you produce? <coughs> Climate change is a problem that we have to acknowledge. I mentioned in terms of the current status, climate change is not on course. We really have to do everything. And for those who have lived long enough and travel in different places, we see changes. When I grew up in my own village, the, the stream that was below our house was, I couldn't go there when it rained, or some seasons. But now my children can cross because there is no water. Something is happening. So how can we combat that? And we also have to be sensitive. You talked about um, the insects. We have to really acknowledge and harness the biodiversity, the rich biodiversity that exists in Africa. You have different breeds of cows. Some are resistant to animal, other are susceptible uh, to, to diseases, and other are susceptible, are susceptible to the same disease. How can we take advantage to the ones that are resistant to the disease? People also rely on different type of food. We have alternative livestock systems. Some are growing, uh, some are farming guinea pigs, some are farming snails, some are farming other small animals. They've become actually national programs on how people can actually say, every day I'm going to have the right amount of proteins that I need. It doesn't matter where it comes from. So looking at these alternative sources uh, for access to animal source uh, proteins is extremely important. So some of those neglected species are very important. 
The same story goes for the crops. When we are talking about vulnerable communities, they've been relying on many of those crops for, 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 for centuries. They're not your maize, it's not wheat or cassava. These are things like anset, teff, taro. How can we bring that into the, in, into the spotlight? And some of these crops really can tell us from the scientific standpoint, what are the genes, what are the mechanisms helping us to control resistance to some of these biotic and abiotic stresses. So I think these are the five different areas of research that we believe if we continue to push on, we'll be making uh, progress uh, towards uh, meeting the sustainable development goals through agricultural development. But they don't have to be operating in silos. We have to integrate other disciplines. The, the ICTs, the social science, risk um, analysis, and markets and stuff like that. So that when people produce 10 tons of something, the market is ready for 10 tons. You don't produce 10 tons just because somebody said this is working and you end up just producing those 10 tons for yourself, things that you can, might not be able to consume. So we have to drive this agenda in a very, very integrated fashion, in a systems approach. So the demand for the research, how do we put this research in the African context? And I think when you look at some of the documents in Africa, you, you can be very excited. Because if you look at the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Plan, which was put in place over 10 years ago, it has very good elements on what we have to do. And focusing on capacity building, how to set the systems at the local, national, and regional level, what type of partnerships we should be putting in place. So this research agenda is really central to the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Plan. Most recently, the science agenda for African agriculture was released, championed by the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. In there, there are specific key messages and commitments that science is too important for Africa to let go. We have to be you talked about evidence base. Why are we doing X and Y and Z? Where's the data? What's the reason? So we really want to drive this agenda to be providing the evidence for some of those decisions to be made. The element of partnership and collaboration is something that we have to stress. And at this point here, I really want to come back to the CGR system. Because if we are to do this seriously, we have to leverage opportunities and resources that exist within these institutions. And at this point, I want to uh, recognize your role, Ulf, in helping us to move one of the consortium research programs on livestock um, from, uh, from the International Livestock Research Institute, where you've been uh, pushing very significantly for that program to be successful. For over 40 years, the CGR Center has really played a critical role. When we're talking about some varieties of, uh, of, of crops in Africa, the CGR can actually put a stamp on it. And I want to list some of them. The impact include maize, new variety of maize, drought tolerant maize, really making headways in providing income and source for food and stuff like that. Wheat, potato, sweet potato, rice. And sweet potato more recently, orange flesh, potato with vitamin A, you eat, you have good nutrition, and you also have the vitamins that you would otherwise have to acquire from different sources. All these are impacts from the CGR system. I also want to list work on livestock from my own institution, vaccine against a very significant animal disease, is cause fever, and many of the things that I have mentioned. Current assessment shows that for a dollar invest in the CGR system, you have up to $9 worth in terms of food production. So that's a very good investment. If we're to continue to do this in partnership with the CGR system, I think African national programs will benefit significantly and will be able to continue to address their own challenges. In terms of capacity building, up to now about 80,000 African professionals have benefited from the CGR system. Imagine if we were to do more in a very concerted manner. We have all the recipe in place. What kind of, uh, uh, what kind of achievement can we be proud of? So the CGR system is extremely important in terms of partnership. In the second part on how to achieve this, what other institutions should we be working with? Because I mentioned collaboration and partnership. 
I want to highlight just our partnership with SLU. I joined this program six years ago, and before I came, there was already a partnership with uh, your university here. And I would like to focus on bioinformatics, where we've been collaborating with Prof. Eric Bonkam. Initially, what are you doing with computers? This is something that, you know, we don't even have this and that. So bioinformatics has penetrated beyond our program in Nairobi. When I was talked about my excitement looking at cassava diseases, we have a very strong African scientist in Tanzania, Joseph Ndunguru, looking at cassava diseases in seven eastern and sun, uh, southern African countries for development of diagnostic. And the contribution, the work, the partnership with SLU has really helped us to integrate the notion of bioinformatics, data management, data analysis very strongly in that program. So the success of that program should also be claimed from SLU. And that's really highlighting the importance of institutions in the South collaborating with advanced research institutions and institutions like yours. We also have to be mindful of the South-South collaboration. If I come to talk to you here in Sweden twice a year, I should be talking to my uh, uh, collaborator in Uganda at least three times. Otherwise, it will not be fair. So we are extremely mindful of the fact that the South-South collaboration is extremely important for this. And you should also claim some of the fame for this South-South collaboration, referring to the conversation that we had in December uh, in Stockholm on the Sida Sci Science Day. Somebody talked about the three PhDs who transform uh, health system in, in one of the African countries. That was many years ago. So we are able to do the South-South collaboration because of your investment that started 40 years ago. We can go to Makerere University, we can go to t institutions in Tanzania, we can talk to Addis Ababa University. Those are the institutions that you have really contributed in building. So South-South collaboration is one of the things that we have to push very strongly. In closing, how do we see ourselves in, uh, in the sustainable development goal, and more importantly, the Agri4C program that you have established. And I want to reiterate my commitment, really, to support, to supporting this program, and to say that, you know, this is a learning experience for me. It's very thrilling, it's very encouraging to see how the Swedish government has provided funding like this that sub really support and get you started on the sustainable development goal number two. Of course, this is linked to other goals. This is really learning for us. And once again, going back to the message, I think you have to ask our governments, what is it that we can do to really emulate what's happening here? Because we don't want discrepancy two or three years down the road. Thank you so much for your attention. And, and I hope I use some of these words to break the ice so that we can continue the conversation with the time allocated today and subsequently. I'm a frequent visitor of Sweden, but I would also want to see many Swedish come to our program in Nairobi. Thank you very much.